<clears throat> okay, looks like uh, we are there, and uh, welcome everybody. We're continuing with uh, a treatise on cosmic fire in depth. I'm sorry for the slight delay. Uh, there's a couple of things that uh, I have to manage with uh, Michael. Uh, simple things, but uh, uh, apparently escaping me for the moment. <laughs> um, I'll do my best uh, to learn learn the ropes, <laughs> as they say on the on the old ships. I do want to uh, thank uh, Michael for being present and Anne is here too. Um, and I'm a co-host, which means that my level of responsibility is uh, <clears throat> perhaps not so technical, which would be a good thing right now. And I do want to welcome uh, Anna and uh, Anne and Annette, um, Catherine, Francois, and Georgina, and Heike, um, Joan, and Margot, uh, Martine, and Nesa, Risto, hi, and uh, two years here somewhere in the distance. <laughs> Okay, and Vivian, hi, and uh, uh, Zanidi, and uh, Frederick, hi, Frederick. Glad to see you here, glad to see you all. Um, well, uh, this is, uh, I keep on saying this about the <clears throat> Tibetan's work, um, and I say that about so many of his books, this is not an easy book. Um, we are on page, more or less, uh, page 83. And if I were to, uh, yeah, page 83, and um, I think we're on the sixth point. And beginning with, well, that little acronym means a treatise on cosmic fire video commentary. I think it's program number um, 58 altogether, but uh, group program number uh, 54. And uh, looks like our day here is the 26th the day after um, Thanksgiving in the United States, getting to be, in a way, a kind of a complicated holiday, but at the same time uh, applicable in terms of the need for uh, gratitude among all the uh, peoples of the world. So, uh, one thing I never have forgotten is that um, what Master Moria said, he said, uh, with gratitude uh, thou hast the best fires. What does that mean, you know? With gratitude you have the best fires. So if we have no gratitude and we simply expect everything to come our way because somehow we are entitled to that, well, we will be avoiding uh, some of the most uplifting fires to which we could possibly be exposed. Now, um, Let's see where we are here. Yeah, that was a quick... Uh, <laughs> yep. 
Yeah. Right. Suddenly, my this visible uh, aspect went to the very top, and I I don't want that to happen. But um, anyway, we we appear to be on page uh, eighty. 83, if I can just find my bearings here. Yep, well there, that's, uh, that's page 82, and that's October. And maybe looks like we're about here. Okay, but I tend to use the, um, I tend to use the book by Alice Bailey, uh, rather than this very uh, sort of elaborate um, commentary. Uh, you can find the Cosmic Fire commentaries written out in full uh, on Makara, and maybe uh, also possibly on YouTube as well, but certainly they are on Makara. And uh, until the last hundred pages of the book, they are actually written. So it's a very elaborate process that took me uh, some number of years. And if you want to study in depth, uh, those commentaries will help you do that. And meanwhile, of course, I'm working on telepathy and the etheric vehicle. Um, program 35 is coming up there, and probably there will be about six, 60 programs, all in all, actually. Um, so, and that also is not an easy book as a matter of fact, the Tibetan says, well, look, we don't even really have uh, a language, a language for it. Let's see if uh, it goes any farther. Yeah, there we are. So now I will switch. Uh, let's see. Let's see what's being... Okay, good. Michael is helping us here about the commentaries and where you can find them. Uh, they are in the uh, chat box. The links that you will need are in the chat box. Okay. Now, let's see. Okay, here is the Alice Bailey um, material. Um, and we're working on, I think, eight points, basically. And we have already covered points number one, the etheric body is the mold, two, the etheric body is the archetype for uh, upon which the dense physical form is built, no matter what kind of physical form it may be. Number three, the etheric body is a web or network of interlacing channels. And um, matter of the four ethers or substance energy of the four ethers is found um, is found within it. Number four, the pranic emanations, when focalized and received, um, react upon the dense matter, which is built upon the scaffolding of the etheric body, and point five, the etheric web during incarnation, and this is an important one, I think, forms a barrier 
between the physical and astral planes. So when that uh, barrier is uh, incorrectly worn thin or inflamed or in, in some way uh, rendered uh, uh, less uh, useful as a barrier, then we get the invasion of the lower astral plane, which we learn uh, the substance of the lower astral plane should not be part of our etheric body at all. Okay. Now, let's see where we are. And I hope you can see. Okay. We did go through the um, sort of anatomy of the names of the uh, etheric aspect and the physical subplanes as well. So, and we compared them, physical, to the solar system planes. So we came all the way down to what we normally call the customary etheric body and the dense physical subplanes. And we saw here the four ethers of the atomic plane, subatomic ether, super etheric and super gaseous. I think those are interesting names. And of course they have their correspondences. Um, the first ether corresponds to the sea of fire or the um, first cosmic ether. The second ether um, corresponds to the monadic plane and is oftentimes called Akasha. The third ether is called super etheric and it corresponds to the atmic plane and it's called aether. Okay, and the fourth uh, ether, which is the one that we're probably learning as a race to come into closer contact with, corresponds to the buddhic plane, to the intuitional plane, and is connected with the element of air. So the elements up here on the cosmic uh, levels of ether are uh, sea of fire, akasha, aether, and air. We're told, interestingly, that when you have the air, you have God. And that's in the uh, formulas which are found in Discipleship in the New Age, Volume 2. Now, you get down to the uh, dense levels, and we have for the uh, ordinary dense, uh, gaseous, which is sub-etheric. That's the name. And I think I kind of want to... Um, make these stand out because the names are maybe a little bit unusual and uh, but they are orienting so the gaseous plane is the sub-etheric after all look we've got to get the anatomy of all of this uh, straightened out as much as we can so we can orient ourselves, know where we are. This is actually uh, our normal mental plane and it's associated with the element of fire and um, it's called the cosmic uh, gaseous plane. The mental plane is the cosmic gaseous. Now friends, 
you should test yourselves on these uh, locations and names. You may say, well, why should I bother doing that? But uh, let's just say that we're on our way towards whatever initiation it may be that lies ahead of us. And this book, Cosmic Fire, is given as a book that evades true understanding except by those who are uh, of the initiate consciousness. The liquid subplane, it's the lowest, next to the lowest subplane of the 49. Um, it's, the, it's the whole uh, astral plane considered cosmically. And uh, its element is water, of course. And then the earthy is the dense, the lowest of the subplanes. The lowest of the subplanes out of the 49 subplanes uh, usually considered when looking at the cosmic uh, etheric physical plane. And that's all, all 49 really you can subdivide further and you can get uh, 343 uh, subplanes. And basically, uh, a subplane is actually a, a state of consciousness. So the, the whole um, uh, normal uh, etheric physical plane is considered to be the cosmic dense uh, plane or solar plane. There are seven of them and uh, uh, out here on the etheric physical level as normally considered we have the cosmic dense plane. So we, we reviewed that and um, and page 83 as well. Gosh, you know, sometimes <laughs> when you're uh, reviewing, you wonder whether you dealt with the subject at all. <laughs> sometimes I do. So, um, so I'll just, I will just read from page 83 and then get on with the, uh, the next part. When the Logos has expanded his consciousness on cosmic levels, he can then transcend the Logoic etheric web, which uh, I suppose are the four um, cosmic ethers, uh, and escape beyond the ring pass knot of his objective manifestation. And what is that objective manifestation? It is considered the, uh, the solar system. Beyond, um, beyond the cosmic physical etheric plane, the solar logo certainly still exists, but his um, objective manifestation is the cosmic etheric physical plane, which is the plane uh, on which uh, we human beings seek at this time the majority of our progress until we are initiates of the sixth degree uh, we are not even preparing to venture onto the cosmic astral plane the christ and the buddha uh, can begin to do that so he wants us to think out the analogy in thinking out this analogy between the protective ethers 
um, for the human being, the protective ethers between our ordinary uh, etheric plane and the, uh, well, between the dense physical and the astral plane, we can make an analogy that the solar logos has the same and I would say planetary logoi have uh, something which is corresponding as well. So um, in thinking out this analogy, he says, we must hold closely in mind the fact that the seven major planes of our solar system are the seven subplanes of the cosmic physical or the lowest cosmic plane. Now, it's difficult. What shall we call it? We can call it the cosmic uh, physical plane, but at the same time, we have to realize that it includes cosmic ethers. So I oftentimes call it the cosmic etheric physical plane. And then we continue with the idea. There will be eight points all in all, and uh, there's no question, but uh, this is a foundation and some memorization. Uh, well, excuse me. Some memorization will inevitably be required. It's, it's the same way. You can't be a good astrologer unless you know by heart the names of the planets, the uh, names of some of the, even some of the major asteroids, um, the names of the signs of the zodiac, the names of some of the major, what we call fixed stars, you know, no one would um, be able to speak their own language <clears throat> unless there was um, a kind of uh, uh, memorization of the alphabet. You've got to know the alphabet. And so the alphabet of the um, esoteric doctrine has so much to do with the planetary logoi, the uh, constellations, uh, and even uh, some of the greater constellations uh, as well. All of this taking place within the local cosmic system of what is called the one about whom naught may be said. Now I realize we are being challenged to use our abstract mind. Well, okay, um, it does have to be used. Uh, it is not used independently of the transcendental mind, which is the intuition. It's not used or should not be used independently of the love and harmony aspects, but nevertheless, some fairly wide ranging picture of the constituents of our local, one about whom naught may be said, um, should be, uh, well, all I can say is made our own. They should be memorized. And then, as Alice Bailey said when uh, about the Tibetan dictating to her, that great uh, vistas would appear uh, before her eyes. It wasn't so much, 
exactly what he was saying, but it was what was implied in what he was saying. And I think we shall find the same for ourselves. We shall find ourselves going into the transcendental mind, which as uh, demanding as the abstract mind may be, is still more revelatory. So uh, DK is always asking us to use the power of analogy. Um, I guess you can have analogy on all the rays, but especially the fourth ray. And that's why he said how important was the fourth ray mind uh, in his work. So number six here, in all the three bodies, human, planetary, uh, and systemic, uh, or logoic, that means solar systemic, or in fact, um, solar logoic, will be found, this is, you know, curious what he's going to give us here, will be found a great organ within the organism, which acts as a receiver of prana. Well, even without me going through this, you would know that the pranic triangle, and maybe especially the spleen in the human being, acts as a receiver of prana, but there's also a uh, part of the pranic triangle. Just, you know, go to Cosmic Fire, page 170, 169, 170 or so, and you will see uh, that spelled out. Um, uh, you will see the importance of a certain shoulder center. It's above the heart, I do believe. Um, and as part of the pranic triangle, a center above the diaphragm, which is a kind of a correspondence to the solar plexus, which is below the diaphragm. And then we have the spleen, which is probably the major uh, receiver at this time. Okay, so um, there will be found a great organ within the organism, which acts as a receiver of prana. And you know, what's interesting, um, DK even went so far as to suggest the kind of clothing that would be salubrious or health giving. And he said, leave the back uh, exposed to the sun because this would bring in the activation of the pranic triangle and uh, I think he's told us that when the spine is correctly adjusted and the uh, spleen and I suppose the other aspects of the pranic triangle are properly vitalized, there will be very little that goes wrong with the uh, human health. Uh, now that still has to be test it out. Interestingly enough, we're entering the age of Aquarius, but it's really the age of Aquarius Leo. And so the spine and the spleen, which are related to Leo and are solar factors, will receive uh, greater 
attentiveness and the whole issue of how to preserve uh, health will be simplified. When you start to look at what we all have to take in terms of a load of pills to supposedly keep our equilibrium, uh, we just know that it can be simplified beyond uh, what is uh, presently the case. So anyway, this organ for the reception of prana has its um, etheric manifestation and its dense physical correspondence. So every uh, one of the chakras in the pranic triangle will be etheric, but there will also be uh, perhaps an outer organ or a gland that will be involved. In the case of the spleen, there will be an etheric spleen, but we all know that that spleen is a definite uh, organ within the dense uh, physical man. And uh, we have to see, you know, what are the correspondences to the center uh, in the between the shoulder blades and the center above the diaphragm. Now he gets into it a little bit here. Well, I think I should never say the word <laughs> a little bit, uh, not in not in this book. But for Master DK, all of this is simply with his voluminous knowledge, the ABC of esotericism. That's all it is, just the very beginning of it. And so, you know, every once in a while, we can pause and, excuse me, a little bit stuck here. We can um, pause and uh, realize the depth and the immensity of that knowledge coming towards us. Okay, so we're looking for this uh, organ of reception, whether it's a single organ or whether it's a triangle as a receiver of prana. So first of all, DK has us look at the solar system. And he says, in the system, the organ of cosmic prana, of the force vitalizing matter, is the central sun, which is the direct receiver and dispenser of cosmic radiation. Now we have to uh, try to understand, is this the central spiritual sun? If it is, um, then we're actually talking about the monadic nature of the solar logos. Uh, but perhaps we're talking about some kind of configuration on the cosmic etheric physical plane. So let's see how he goes on. Um, 
<clears throat> sorry. Oh, he goes on with this. This is one of the threefold divisions of the primordial ray of active uh, intelligence. Now, what we have learned is that upon the highest of the uh, etheric, cosmic etheric subplanes, there are three uh, great circles. And I wonder if I can uh, sort of um, find them. Um, let's see. Let's see if I can. I'm sorry if uh, for a slight delay here. Um, okay. This would be the F disk. And um, here are two years diagrams. And let's see if I can Open this. Okay. And um, now to make it visible to you. Okay. Now it is um, visible to you. Okay. Here we go. Well, the three we are talking about are the three here on the Logoic Plane, and they're called the three Logoi. And what we have in relation to them is the Father, which is the red triangle, it could be a circle, the sun, which is the indigo triangle, and then the uh, Holy Spirit, uh, or Brahma, uh, which is the green triangle. And they are called the three Logoi. Now somehow it's, uh, really important to have this particular wonderful chart, which um, of course DK's, it's DK's chart, but uh, a combination of uh, uh, Keith Bailey's work and Tuya's work has rendered this uh, into color and shown some links that are very important. You may notice down here that we have a green circle. We have a, a indigo blue circle and a red circle. The red circle is in a way shambolic. The blue circle is hierarchical and is um, a sub, uh, what should we say, a super etheric plane, as as high as it goes. And the green circle uh, is personal. So somehow these three give quite a characterization of what is going on on the cosmic etheric physical plane. When I say cosmic etheric, I mean here are four ethers and here are three dense levels when you consider the whole thing cosmically. So sometimes, see up here you have circles, okay? But this is so far beyond, beyond that it's uh, 
well, it's out of the range, really, out of the range of even our high initiates. Uh, but they thrive and live, the highest of the initiates, uh, on these two esoteric levels where we have seven monadic types here and three super monadic types which are uh, found in relation to the great council in Shambhala. So the colors, I think, uh, definitely help us to understand the qualities that we are uh, dealing with at this point. Okay, I just wanted to show you that and make sure that this particular chart, and I'm, I'm trying to think of where you can access uh, this. Um, I know we have access to it. Uh, Tuya did a terrific job uh, getting this ready. And uh, as far as these huge cosmic planes go, they would be just as complicated as the articulated lower cosmic etheric physical plane, except there's just no room to portray them in that way and probably um, a lot of what would be portrayed would be rather uh, meaningless to us except in an intellectual manner. Now, I'll go back and uh, there we are again. So, um, we're talking about the solar system. And remember what I said, that the solar system exists on the cosmic etheric physical plane. It does not exist as a solar system on the cosmic astral, cosmic mental and beyond though it exists as part of the anatomy and physiology, cosmophysiology of the solar logos on the cosmic astral, cosmic mental, and uh, maybe, well, I think that might be as far as we can take it for the moment. Now, so, um, in the system, the organ of cosmic prana is the force vitalizing matter. <clears throat> uh, it, is, it is the central sun, which is the uh, direct receiver and dispenser of cosmic radiation uh, that, uh, well, if we want to really look at what the central sun might be, here I go again. So forgive me for this. Um, we could go all the way up here and say that a kind of central sun exists on the cosmic mental level and is incorporated within this little triangle here, which represents, and it's only one of 49, it represents our particular one about whom naught may be said. And that of course there are 48 others. It's just, and, and this is just, a drop in the bucket. This is just the beginning. Uh, up on the cosmic uh, attic plane, 
the correspondence to the sea of fire, uh, there is one great entity, and it's cause, called a, a cosmic para-Brahman. And in a way that might be looked uh, at as the central sun of all of these many ones about whom not may be said, 49 triangles and seven uh, super entities who are sub parabramic. Now, if this is this thing here is called a cosmic parabram, then these seven are the subsidiaries of that cosmic parabram, and each one of the ones about whom naught may be said are subsidiaries of these uh, sub parabramic logoi. Well, this is way beyond our masters altogether way beyond them. The kinds of entities <clears throat> who are making application to that kind of level are solar logoi and constellational logoi. Uh, I guess we're calling them cosmic logoi. So we can understand how this ladder of ascent continues to rise. And even though this looks like a huge map, it's really very tiny, very tiny indeed, compared to what is going on in our galaxy and in the family of galaxies in which sevens are gathered and a, a major kind of entity that encapsulates them all is existing. So suffice it to say that in our uh, particular solar system, we will have, uh, not, excuse me, in, in our particular, um, well, sort of um, universal, um, universal logos, there will be a huge number of positions positions of ascent possible to us as we go along and as we regroup with the other fellow entities to whom we are related. It's not like we go through all of this as an isolated being. There's a merging which occurs. All right. Now, so anyway, um, in the the organ for the system is the central sun. However, we want to name that which is the direct receiver and dispenser of cosmic uh, radiation. In other words, it's receiving from a cosmic logos and beyond because it is still uh, solar systemic. Now, this central sun, uh, this is one of the threefold divisions, which I've 
pointed out here, of the primordial ray of active uh, intelligence. And each of the cosmic rays, this is interesting, each of the cosmic rays is in essence threefold, a fact which is oft overlooked, though logically obvious. Um, and that will make the completed nine. Now there's a lot to be studied here, no question about it. Uh, each ray is the vehicle of a cosmic entity. Now, not only in Shambhala is there a ray lord for each of the seven rays, but now we're talking about rays in a larger sense. Each of the cosmic rays is in essence threefold, should be logically obvious. Each ray is the vehicle for a cosmic entity and all existence is necessarily triple in manifestation. Even our own monad, well, actually, you know, you can't talk about our own monad because the monad is the, is the one, but um, we have uh, will, wisdom, and activity, a three-foldness with whatever life and being is found at the very center. The central sun has within its periphery a center of reception with a surface radiation. Okay. Now let's see if some hints about this uh, solar systemic situation can be gathered from um, what he says about the planet. In the planet, there will be found a similar organ or receiver within its etheric body, the locality of which uh -huh, is not for exoteric publication and therefore cannot be revealed or cannot therefore be revealed. Now oh, that may be interesting. Maybe it's getting a little too close to home to reveal um, the uh, locality of this particular organ, where it can be found. But it will be found, obviously, within the etheric body of the planetary uh, logos. And uh, is there a difference between the etheric body of a planetary logos and that of a solar logos? Well, a lot depends on how we look at the higher three subplanes of the mental plane. Are they dense? They are dense to the solar logos, but are they dense to the planetary logos? That is a question. In connection with the location of the two poles, now immediately one is beginning to think of some higher correspondence to Babbitt's atom. 
We've seen the picture of the atom with all of its uh, currents and its spirilli and its uh, uh, lines of force coming in and going out. We've seen that. Maybe I should try to dig that up right now, but I'd rather not. It's just uh, too lengthy a process. So in connection with the location of the two poles, north and south, or it is connected, and is at the center around which the globe rotates and is the source of the legend of the sacred fertile land within the sphere of polar influences. Now, let's just say that there are old stories uh, of how the axis of the earth tilts down and then tilts up again, literally and physically. And three and a half times, apparently this has occurred, and we see both uh, our planet uh, Uranus and uh, whose axis is tilted below the horizon, as it were, and um, Venus, whose axis is almost entirely tilted with the north occupying the, uh, what would normally be considered the position of the south. Okay, so there is that uh, somehow some sacred organ or organs connected with the poles. And um, basically, he says we can't reveal where it is, but he's already giving uh, some pretty strong hints, uh, is he not? And um, the mythic land of exceeding fertility, of abundant luxuriance and of phenomenal growth, vegetable, animal, and human would naturally lie where prana is received. So um, let's just say there's a land, uh, we call it in the hyper Borean regions and around the, the uh, axis of the pole, uh, that kind of etheric organ can apparently be found. Now, this is just a hint to us and we can keep it uh, in our minds and discover more as we go. It is the esoteric Garden of Eden, the land of physical perfection. Surface radiation demonstrates after distribution a planetary prana. So maybe that's a bit of a surprise, the location of that particular organ. You see, there are analogies here, but these analogies are not exact when it comes to positioning these uh, etheric uh, receivers, these organs. This we will see when we look at um, how it goes with man. Okay, but I do want to, uh, I'm going to make this a little different color so it does stand out. 
<clears throat> the Garden of Eden, well, apparently, esoterically existed. There were uh, different races of pre-individualized man um, and the Adamic race was one and following that the uh, is it Hyperborean race was the next followed by the Lemurian root race followed by Atlantean Aryan and then the sixth root race coming up and it doesn't seem uh, yet to have a name um, but it is the sixth and will we pass through a seventh apparently Venus did not have to pass through a seventh because it accomplished so much so fast all within uh five uh scheme rounds a scheme round is different from a chain round you go round and round the chain for a chain round but you go round and round the scheme in various ways for a scheme round now you know uh you, you you begin to wonder how is it how many centuries of study and thought did it take master decay to be so well informed about these matters that uh, someone like him could write a book like a treatise on cosmic fire suppose someone came to you and said won't you please write the psychological key to the secret doctrine what would you do you know i'm sure that many of us would be nonplussed uh, at that kind of request but we are sort of bathing in this incredible knowledge realized as we go to be more and more uh, unbelievably capacious extensive and deep than we might ever have thought. Now, when it comes to man, maybe things will get <laughs> a little easier and we can draw the analogies. I'm trying to see whether uh, I have anything here that uh, any particular well, I certainly, I certainly went into it in great depth. That is for sure. So uh, I know we we don't have time to do everything in one brief incarnation, and we must confine the scope of our study and the scope of our meditation. We cannot race all over the planet using, you know, third-ray tendencies and hope that we will really accomplish uh, any significant learning we're likely to just become uh, dissipated, um, scattered, we might say. And uh, probably that is not too useful when it comes to the expression 
of the divine plan. But let's look at man. In man, the reception is the spleen through its etheric counterpart. Well, that um, of that we seem to have some idea. There is an external spleen and there is a chakra and does it have like, uh, I think is six petals, um, which is the sustainment of the physical spleen after distribution over the entire body. And immediately that makes us think, ah, distribution from the planetary center over the entire planet. Ah, distribution from the solar center of reception over the entire solar system. So probably we have an analogy going there. Um, uh, after distribution over the entire body via the etheric network, it demonstrates uh, in surface radiation as the health aura. Remember what I'd said before, based on what DK had said, when the spine and the spleen are given proper attention, very little uh, in terms of health will be found to malfunction uh, in the human being. So that distribution through surface radiation will analogously count as well for the um, planetary receiver and for the solar systemic uh, receiver. It's a little, you know, maybe a little more difficult to find that solar systemic receiver than it is the planetary or the human receiver. And then, um, well, let's see all this. This is, uh, this will be interesting. Um, because the analogies should be uh, clearly demonstrated in this tabulation. The uh, notice the receptive center is the spleen when it comes to man, the planetary pole when it comes to the planet and well, the, <coughs> also a polar region when it comes to the central sun. But we have to decide what is that central sun. And I think we have to uh, look within what might be called the ethers, cosmic, uh, or the ethers of our solar logos, which um, overlap to a degree with the ethers of our planetary logos. So this will probably be found uh, in the sea of fire, the pole of the central sun. Of course, it's also possible that within the structure of the 
sun itself, we could be searching for the uh, um, pole of the central sun. So I'm, I'm just going to say that I'm certainly less certain about this particular one. But I do see there's plenty to do for us in the next time we get together on this matter. And um, what does it say here in terms of point number seven? At least I can read that much. That um, thus, in all the three bodies, with the resemblance clearly seen and the waking working out in perfect correspondence uh, is easily demonstra demonstrable. So thus in all the three bodies. And then he attends to demonstrate uh, the three entities and some very uh, esoteric and obscure um, <clears throat> references are made, though in a position of relative clarity. Well, look, you know, I tell you, I remember being very excited about this book. And there was a time when I lived in New Mexico. And there was a place not too far from Santa Fe, New Mexico. And it was called Ghost Ranch. Well, in a way, the ghost is the spirit. So I invited Cosmic Fire aficionados, um, Daniel, Peter, David, um, who else? Um, and of course I came along and we poured over cosmic fire for three days Staying at Ghost Ranch, yes. Uh, eating at Ghost Ranch, and somehow entering as deeply into the uh, subject as we possibly could, which you always learn is never as deeply as may be possible. Now, if 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 any of us doesn't have the feeling that we're just scratching the surface here a little bit, then uh, I don't I don't know why we don't have that estimation. We are just um, scratching the surface. But look, if we never get into it, then what chance? do we have of absorbing anything from the psychological key to the secret doctrine. I guess we know a lot more about man and our planet than we know about the structure of the sun and uh, as a representation of the solar logos. And that's why it may be difficult to find that uh, pole of the central sun. But we do have two poles, at least. And for man, the receptive center is not the pole. It is the spleen. And from another point of view, it is the entire pranic uh, triangle. Uh, yeah, well, oh, 
this would get into heavy math because it is the receiving center for the sun that causes the very slow uh, rotation of the entire solar system. And that rotation uh, has its own mathematics, which DK says, look, um, I'm not going to get into that as if to prove it. You just have to absorb what I say. So that's what we'll work on the next time. Um, obviously, we haven't gone very far in page numbers, but we have uh, at least somewhat. Let's see. What page did we reach? <laughs> Goodness, if I lose that. Um, I think we really only did one page. Um, I should know what page we've reached. Yeah, we're uh, getting close to 85. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, there it is. Thank you, Michael. 85. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to interpolate that. It's really 84. <laughs> I'd like it to be 85, but it's close and not quite uh, not quite there yet. 83 to um, 84 slash 85, maybe that'll be my way of doing it. So um, I will transfer this down. I, I find myself getting very intrigued by what DK is saying, because even though I did um, a lot of uh, written commentary, I really wonder how deeply I went. It seems that greater depth is now possible, even though there's a certain amount of uh, spontaneous kind of um, spontaneous kind of reporting. So this would be the end of program 58, I guess. And uh, it would go from 83 to 80, <laughs> 80, 84, 85. And the next, whoops, sorry, something happened here. I want to, uh, those are not pluses, they are that. And um, we'll begin with uh, program, uh, uh, does anybody have the time when that occurs? 59, 55? Next program, mm -hmm. December 10th. Okay, good. Thank you very much. And um, let's just say we're starting from 84 to 80, 85 and onward. And December 10th, uh-huh. Okay. There may be a, a 90th birthday going on in our family up here. And well, we'll just have to see uh, to what degree <clears throat> that may confine me, but we'll have time to see. So 10 December. Um, it really, um, this shows us the power 
of the law of analogy. Now, um, I don't doubt that there is some kind of etheric apparatus on the top of the human head, but let's just say the spleen is considered the point of absorption. So basically we have uh, thus far an analogy between three different types of entities. We don't know enough about the cosmic logoi to carry the analogy too much further. We, we do know that uh, the um, uh, sun, our sun, our solar logos, is a, a heart center within the cosmic logos. But in terms of this etheric organ of reception, what are we to say? what corresponds to the spleen? How would we recognize or arrange a polar type of reception for a cosmic logos, um, such as our seven solar systems? Um, the seven solar systems of which ours is one or the little bear or Orion or any of those cosmic logoi, how could we conceive of a reception, a receiver, uh, etherically um, demonstrating where would it go? In what relation would it exist? And then, of course, there's the whole super cosmic logos, uh, the one about whom naught may be said. At least what we do have there is the idea that the zodiac of constellations provides the heart in the head center of that one about whom naught may be said. And maybe there is some kind of etheric sustainment of that heart in the head center for that great supercosmic logos. But, you know, look, we're, we'd be way, way beyond our capabilities. Right now, we just have to learn to control our astral body, uh, sidestep uh, illusion, uh, learn to receive um, direction from the soul and from uh, the master and from the ashram and finally from the spiritual triad because the Antikarana has been someone somewhat built. We have much more modest objectives than to range through the higher cosmos. But it probably uh, doesn't hurt to know a little bit about it from the structural point of view. Okay, friends, now I realize uh, if I ask you questions, or for comments, that this is a very abstruse section of the book. It's much easier to understand the central section of this book. And then again, once we get into the, the end of the book, uh, it becomes in a way very cosmic and difficult, but uh, I've done what I could. So is there anybody that would like to, um, in our chat, ask any questions or make any comments 
about um, this particular material. I realize I've gone on quite a bit here. Um, and uh, yes, quite a bit, but there is no other program uh, following this program. So I guess I could do that at the risk of uh, uh, boring you or confusing you <laughs> and myself at the same time. But of course, it, it will clarify. That much we know. If Master DK studied avidly for a minimum of 2,500 years, and that's just a minimum, then we can certainly accomplish a little something if we put in a few centuries, a few lifetimes, and become uh, somewhat analogous to his uh, capacities or our capacities can become somewhat analogous to his capacities. We don't know in this great jigsaw how the pieces will begin to come together. Um, and, you know, uh, I told you my story about liking to break thermometers with mercury in them and when I was a kid because I liked to play with the mercury, maybe not so healthy. We don't know how the little beads of mercury will coalesce. We only know that they will coalesce and form some kind of oneness of perception, oneness of knowledge, oneness in wisdom, that much we can have faith in. Okay, so is there anything that anybody would like to say or is there anything? Nothing right now. Listen, I don't blame anybody. <laughs> This is a tough go. And you might say, well, is it too tough for me? Well, it, you know, it's too tough for me. Maybe it's too tough for you. But at the same time, it's both too tough and not too tough. We've got to get familiar with it so that we can tell something about this amazing esoteric structure which um, lies behind human dynamics, planetary dynamics, and uh, solar dynamics. Now, let's make an analogy. If DK says, once the spine is given the proper understanding attention and the spleen uh, is also attended to, there will be very little wrong with the physical health uh, of the individual. Well, what would we say then about the planet? Is there a, an analogy there? about a healthy, sacred planet. Right now, we're in transition. We have a planet that uh, is not yet sacred. It has a lot of sickness in it and demonstrating in various countries and demonstrating um, throughout humanity's personality, but uh, what is the an, an analogy in the planet to the human spine? Maybe that 
picture of Babbitt's atom will tell us something about the uh, the spine between the poles uh, of of the planet. And what is the spleen? Well, or that organ of reception. That organ of reception is around the north pole. Or, you know, is it exactly there? Or, you know, is it slightly offset? Those are issues to be taken up, but uh, we're looking to have a sacred planet. We're, we're looking to have the essential function of our planet come forward and be in full demonstration. Maybe, by analogy, once the spine of the planet and its organ of reception, which in the human being is the spleen, are attended to properly, we will have our sacred planet. And uh, I guess, now this is interesting. We don't yet have a sacred solar system. Of course, to us, it's very sacred. But compared to the system of Sirius, it isn't sacred. It's one of the non-sacred solar systems that are found within the seven solar systems of which ours is one. Maybe we could carry it further. What is the spine of the uh, solar logos working through the sun? And what is that organ of reception apparently involving the pole of the sun? How do we find that? And will that contribute one day to making our solar system a truly sacred solar system? Right now, it is astrally polarized and it's working towards a kind of third initiation cosmically considered, which uh, Sirius has taken. There's an analogy there <clears throat> that uh, as Sirius is to the sun, so Venus is to the earth. So the solar angel or angel of the presence is to man. So follow the analogies, if possible, and we will learn about the manner of progression, the manner of elevation. Um, <clears throat> we will learn how the fifth law of the soul, what is it? the law of group progress, the law of elevation, we will learn how that fifth law of the soul applies to the entire planet and of course all the chains and globes within the planet and how it also applies to the solar system itself, to the solar logos. I'm trying to think the value of all this. Now certainly it is a workout for the, con for the abstract mind 
don't you find it to be that case? So, you know, it works out for the, con for the abstract mind and maybe our jaw drops and say, says, how can we relate to this? But in time, we can and we will. All right, I threw another four or five minutes of talk in there. Is there anything that anybody would like to say? Or would not like to say? <laughs> I think it's all telepathic right now. <laughs> yeah, now you've got to read that book. Well, you know, there, there's something to what you just said, Michael. Because the um, the telepathy uh, is vague at first, and then comes the formulation of the impression that has been received. That, um, but that follows next. At first, there is a stirring. What is it? Something is activated. What is it? And then gradually, word forms are found uh, to make this uh, a more transmissible uh, type of impression. So I, I can understand the telepathic nature uh, of this and I and look we may get the intuition but we also have to exercise the mental level to help formulate in appropriate and recognizable words the kind of substance that has impressed us the science of impression is of the utmost importance. And as you read along with me in the telepathy book, you'll see how important it really is. Um, you know, all as part of the supreme science of contact. Okay, friends, uh, I hope... Uh, I have not uh, condemned us to complete silence forever. Um, okay, so look, all of us, Tui and myself and Mikhail and BL and Joe and Harold, and uh, Olivia and uh, Anne from uh, the Vietnamese group, among other things, um, and Frederick, who's been with us here. Um, we wish you the best confident attitude as you attempt to absorb some of these foundational matters which uh, might seem very difficult to access at first but have faith and have confidence and you will certainly uh, improve in your access of these things and later as we get into the pages of beyond a hundred, I guess, you'll find it a lot easier to offer your opinions because we'll be dealing with solar fire and not so much with fire by friction, which is Brahmic and which we have passed by a long time ago, but which is still primordial to our solar system. 
even if it is not the divine ray. So we wish you the very best, and I thank everyone who attended, and I, I thank uh, Michael for being the the hosts here, and uh, both Tuyan and are here too, so I'm grateful for your presence and then everybody else who came along. And hopefully, uh, hopefully your head is not entirely spinning and you could say, if I got one thing out of this section of text, what would it be? What would it be? For me, um, looking for the organ of reception, I'm amazed at how much it is associated with the pole of the particular heavenly body or the pole of man. Well, there is a pole, but there's also a central spleen for man. So the whole question of the location of these etheric organs of reception, that has been for me, I think, uh, a kind of a wake up and um, yeah, a wake up uh, a piece of information but you can come up with your own. Okay, so um, we continue later. I don't know if we have anything tomorrow. Um, I don't, I think it's a Saturday and I, I don't know if we do have anything tomorrow. And to you, if you're there, do you know, or Anne? Um, tomorrow. November 27th, Soul of yep. Nations. Oh, really? And then Advent is. Uh, oh, well, then 28th. we indeed. Uh -huh. Soul of Nations tomorrow. Okay, and well. Advent on the 28th, and then December 1st, Science of Triangles. So then we got December 2nd, Identify as Being. This okay, well. Of glamour on the 3rd. <laughs> I have a lot of stuff then coming up, but I'm. Glad to know about that uh, Soul of Nations, Destiny of Nations broadcast. Okay. We have climate tomorrow, to you. What? Both? Really? Maybe it's different than the master schedule. Uh huh. Well, check your schedules, and I'll check mine, and we'll see what really is happening. Okay, so friends, that's it for now. And uh, we wish you uh, uh, courage to continue. See you then. I'll stop the recording. Yeah, tomorrow. And, tomorrow yeah. it's climate change meditation, which was changed from Soul of Nations. Uh huh. Uh huh. Okay. And Maybe, uh, well, we'll see. Maybe two of you will do that one. We'll see what is possible. Okay, I'm going to s stop the uh, recording and then uh, Michael can, because he is the host, he can dismiss us. Okay, thank you, everybody. And uh, see you sooner than I thought. <laughs> okay, bye for now.